What is going on everybody? It's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my endocrinology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about the embryology of endocrine glands, the anatomy of endocrine glands. We talked about growth hormone, prolactin, cortisol, estrogens, progesterone, testosterone, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, oxytocin, FSH, LH, TSH, thyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone, and all of this lovely stuff. Today, it's time to talk about one of the medications that can help us manage diabetes mellitus, which is a disease characterized by impaired glucose metabolism. What is the mechanism of action of metformin? What are the side effects? Let's find out. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, and may your future be ever so sweet. This is my endocrinology playlist. Please watch these videos in order for maximum understanding and retention, especially my video on insulin and diabetes is mellitus. First, a quick review on the physiology. Your endocrine system has a hierarchy like this, where you have a CEO, followed by a general manager, followed by employees on one hand and independent contractors on the other hand. The employees have to listen to the general manager, whereas the independent contractors could not care less about the general managers. Who is the CEO of your endocrine system? It is the famous hypothalamus of the brain. How about the general manager? This is the pituitary gland. Tell me about the employees that are influenced by the pituitary gland. Well, the pituitary gland can influence the thyroid gland. How come? By secreting TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. The same pituitary gland can stimulate the adrenal cortex. How? By secreting adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH. The pituitary gland can also stimulate the gonads. How come? By secreting the follicle-stimulating hormone as well as the luteinizing hormone. So the employees of the general manager include the thyroid gland, the adrenal cortex, and the gonads. What are the gonads? In females, they are the ovaries. In males, they are the testes. How about the independent contractors that do not obey the pituitary? They do not care. Instead of thyroid, say parathyroid. Instead of the cortex of the adrenal gland, say medulla of the adrenal gland. And instead of the gonad, we have the pancreas. And this is a very important point. Your pituitary, which is part of the brain, has no influence over the pancreas. The same could be said of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus does not have a direct influence on your pancreas. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, drop your favorite food emoji in the comments. Let's talk about the pancreas. Your pancreas has two parts, exocrine and endocrine. What's the difference? An exocrine gland is a gland that has a duct. Here is the duct of the gland and here is the acinus. The acinus will make the secretions. The secretions will flow into the duct and then the duct will release those secretions to the outside, which is usually inside of a cavity. The cavity is usually close to the acinus. However, endocrine, it's a different story. Here is the endocrine cell. The endocrine cell will dump all of its secretion directly to the bloodstream. And the bloodstream will then distribute those secretions all over the body in a more generalized fashion as opposed to the localized fashion of the exocrine. So exocrine, exo means to the outside, but endo means to the inside. Inside what? Inside the bloodstream. Anatomically, your pancreas has a head, a body, and a tail. Near the head, there is a lovely uncinate process or uncus. Functionally, your pancreas has exocrine glands and endocrine glands. The endocrine glands tend to be more abundant near the body and the tail of the pancreas, whereas the exocrine glands are more abundant around the head. Exocrine glands do have ducts. Endocrine glands do not have ducts. When the exocrine glands of the pancreas put their secretions into the ducts, these secretions eventually end up in the small intestine, particularly the duodenum. But when the endocrine glands of the pancreas, which happen to be ductless, secrete their secretions, they dump them into the bloodstream. The exocrine glands of the pancreas are those that secrete the pancreatic digestive enzymes. Whereas the islets of Langerhans, which are endocrine, secrete pancreatic hormones, not enzymes. The exocrine enzymes include amylase, lipase, colipase, trypsinogen, and more. And I've talked about them in detail in my physiology playlist. Whereas the endocrine glands of the pancreas include 
alpha cells which secrete glucagon, beta cells which secrete insulin, and delta cells which secrete the doofus. Who is the doofus? Somatostatin is the doofus. If you wish to download these doozy colorful notes, go to medicosisperfectionalis.com. I help you learn, understand, and pass exams. If you want me to personally tutor you, reach out to me on my website. Why is somatostatin the doofus? Because it inhibits everything. It even inhibits its own secretions. Again, alpha cells make glucagon, whereas beta cells make insulin. Glucagon is a hormone secreted by the alpha cells of the pancreas, and glucagon's job is mainly to raise the level of glucose in your blood. But insulin is the converse of this. It's the opposite. Insulin, secreted by the beta cells, tends to lower glucose in your bloodstream by pushing the glucose into the cells. So the glucose is going to leave the blood and go into your cells, leaving less glucose available in the bloodstream. And again, somatostatin, the doofus that is secreted by the delta cell, is a universal inhibitor. It inhibits everything, even its own secretion. A tale of two hormones, insulin land versus glucagon land. Insulin is an anabolic hormone, whereas glucagon is a catabolic hormone. Insulin is a builder, glucagon is a destroyer. Insulin is anabolic, it is protein anabolic, glycogen anabolic, and fat anabolic. Protein anabolic because it builds up the small amino acids into bigger proteins. It builds up the small glucose into bigger glycogen. It builds up small free fatty acids into bigger triglycerides. Whereas glucagon does the opposite. It breaks down proteins into amino acids, breaks down glycogen into glucose, and breaks down triglycerides into free fatty acids. Because insulin turns glucose into glycogen, you will end up with less glucose in your blood. But because glucagon does the opposite, breaks down glycogen into glucose, you will end up with more sugar in your blood. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. You can learn more about metabolism, glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, etc. in my biochemistry playlist. So insulin wants to lower glucose in my bloodstream. But how does insulin do that? By pushing glucose into the cell. So insulin literally tells the cell to open its mouth, the mouth is known as GLUT4, and take the glucose inside. And it's not just glucose. Insulin is going to push the amino acids into the cell and push the free fatty acids into the cell. It even pushes potassium and phosphate into the cells. Why does insulin push free fatty acids into the cell? Because insulin is anabolic and it wants to stimulate triglyceride synthesis. Why did insulin push amino acids into the cell? Because insulin is anabolic, it wants to build up those amino acids into proteins. Why did insulin push the glucose into the cell? Because insulin is anabolic and it wants to build up the glucose into bigger glycogen, leaving less glucose in the bloodstream. But what happens if I have diabetes mellitus? Okay, insulin is not functioning, glucose is not entering into the cell, glucose is going to remain in your blood and this causes a rise in glucose sugar, which can lead to a variety of symptoms, such as the evil non-enzymatic glycosylation, which can damage many a tissue. Next, some quick notes on the pathology, diabetes. Let's use the KISS principle and keep it simple stupid. This is the ligand, this is the receptor, okay? This is insulin, this is the insulin receptor. So if I have a disease where I lack insulin itself, we're going to call this type 1. But if I have a disease where the receptor is not listening to the insulin, we call this type 2. So type 1 is a disease in the ligand, whereas type 2 is a problem in the receptor. Why is this? Because the ligand alone is not active, the receptor alone is normally not active, it's only the ligand receptor complex, only when the ligand and the receptor hug and kiss one another will you achieve the normal physiological functions. And this classification is not peculiar to diabetes mellitus. You can even find it in diabetes insipidus. Type 1 diabetes insipidus is a problem in the ADH itself. Type 2 diabetes insipidus is a problem in the receptor. Type 1 diabetes insipidus is known as central or neurogenic diabetes insipidus, whereas type 2 is called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Even rickets is classified into type 1 and type 2. Type 1, 
Blame the ligand. Type 2. Blame the receptor. So what's the problem in type 1 diabetes? It's usually that I have insulin deficiency because my pancreas is now toast. My pancreas has given up, probably due to autoimmune destruction. And when the pancreas is toast, insulin is no more. Insulin is normally the major anti-ketogenic hormone in the body. So when I lack insulin, I get more ketosis. And when ketosis gets severe enough, it becomes ketoacidosis, and we call this diabetic ketoacidosis. But in type 2 diabetes, the problem is in the insulin receptor. Insulin might even be normal, therefore ketosis is not absent but less likely. And that's why the disease that tends to happen in type 2 is the hyperosmotic hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome. But again, this is just a simplified view. To keep things simple, reality is more complex. Third, some pharmacology notes. Of course, if you can control your blood sugar without medications, more power to you. Proper diet and exercise can help many people. What are the pharmacological options that can manage type 2 diabetes? We have big ones and small ones. The big ones, sulfonylureas, metformin, the thiazolidine diones, which end in glitazone, such as pioglitazone, rosiglitazone, etc., GLP-1 agonists, such as semaglutide, trade name Ozempic, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, such as citagliptin and the other gliptins, Insulin itself, the minor ones include the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, the SGLT2 inhibitors, which will make your glucose fly into the urine, and they have the root flu in the name, such as canagliflozin, amylene analogs, and meglitinide analogs. Who named these things? In today's topic, we're going to talk about metformin. If you want to learn about all the others, refer to my endocrinology playlist. The story of going downhill. The story of losing everything, like a country song. But unlike the country song, you are not getting your wife back or your house back. It only moves downhill. It's not impossible to go uphill, but less likely. First, I start with impaired glucose tolerance. And my doctor will recommend lifestyle modifications only, diet and exercise. Then I get to type 2 diabetes and it has been with me for 1 to 5 years. My doctor will recommend diet, exercise, and will add metformin. You know what? It's 5 to 15 years. Metformin and something else. Um, they're not working. Metformin and two other medications. Uh, not working. All the above plus insulin. Not working. I will end up needing multiple insulin injections every single day. Metformin. The mechanism of action is not fully understood. Some argue that it inhibits MGPD which is the mitochondrial glycerophosphate dehydrogenase. That's probably why it can suppress gluconeogenesis and act like insulin but unlike glucagon. Metformin increases the peripheral tissue sensitivity to insulin. The receptor will tend to listen to insulin better and become more tolerant to insulin, which increases the glucose uptake by your cell and it increases glycolysis. Metformin can suppress gluconeogenesis mainly in the liver. Here's a question for the pros. Besides the liver, in what other organ does gluconeogenesis take place? If you have an answer, comment below. Another mechanism is that metformin's action are related to adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase, also known as AMPK. If you want me to make a video on AMPK, please comment below. Side effects of metformin include the following. Gastrointestinal side effects such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, these are relatively common. Lactic acidosis is rare but could be fatal. This causes metabolic acidosis, of course, usually with high anion gap. So we get high anion gap metabolic acidosis. This puts a pressure load on the kidney. So be careful if the patient has kidney disease. You might consider something else other than metformin, or you might adjust the dose. When your patient has very high BUN and creatinine, try to avoid metformin. Next, metformin can inhibit the absorption of vitamin B12, cobalamin, and vitamin B9, which is folate. Without B12 and folate, I tend to develop megaloblastic anemia, which is a macrocytic anemia with high MCV. How can I tell the difference between vitamin B12 and folate deficiency? 
Vitamin B12 usually has neurological symptoms, whereas folate deficiency usually does not. I'm talking in adults, not in a fetus. Unlike the sulfonylureas, which is a class of medication that increases insulin release, metformin does not raise insulin release. That's why metformin is less likely to cause hypoglycemia or weight gain. In fact, metformin might help you lose some weight. Here is a quick comparison between the sulfonylureas and metformin. Sulfonylureas are insulin secretagogues. What does that even mean? They tend to secrete more insulin from the pancreatic beta cells, whereas metformin, chemically a biguanide, is not an insulin secretagogue and is not going to increase insulin release from the pancreas. If you increase insulin release from the pancreas, guess what's going to happen? Insulin is going to push my glucose into the cells, especially adipose tissue. So there will be less glucose available in the bloodstream. There will be more glucose and free fatty acids available in the adipose tissue until I gain weight. But in metformin, since I am not boosting insulin release from the pancreas, hypoglycemia is less likely and weight gain is less likely compared to the sulfonylureas. Do you want to learn more about insulin, the types of insulin, how to calculate the dose of insulin, the different glucose-lowering agents, cortisol, thyroid hormone, estrogen, progesterones, androgens? Download my endocrine pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionedit.com. It comes with videos, notes, and cases. If you value what I do, help me make more videos by supporting the channel. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 600 premium videos available on my channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal or Venmo, go to my website to download my courses, notes and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionandus, where medicine, chemistry, math and physics make perfect sense.